You will hear a telephone conversation between a language student and an advisor. First, you have some time to look at questions one to six. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to six. Homestay Language Learning, Lisa McDowell here. How can I help you? Hello, my name's Dan. Hello, Dan. And I'm going to be living with a family in Edinburgh for three months, so I'd like some advice on what to bring with me. I'm flying in via Singapore on the 15th. Right. Well, perhaps most important of all are your documents. Vaccination certificate, sponsor's letter, and the certifying letter from us for immigration. Yes, I've got all those in order, I think. What I'm really wondering about are money and clothes and things for my room. Personal effects, in other words. OK. Let's start with cash. You'll already have money in your bank account here, of course, but make sure when you get here you have some cash on you. Pounds, that is, not euros or dollars. How much do you suggest? I'd say 50 as an absolute minimum. OK. Now, the next thing is which clothes to bring. What do you think? Well, as I'm sure you know, it can get pretty cold here, so you will need some warm clothing. There are shops near here that sell winter clothes quite cheaply, so you really don't need to bring much. Do make sure, though, that you have at least one thick sweater and a jacket with you when you arrive here. The temperature is likely to be a lot lower than in Singapore. <laughs> Thanks for the warning. Now. Something else I'm not sure about is whether to bring my computer. It's a laptop, so it won't take up much room. Two problems. Firstly, it might not be compatible with the electricity supply in this country. And secondly, there's a risk of it getting broken in transit. Someone travelling here had hers smashed only last month. But surely I can carry it as hand luggage. Usually, yes, but because of all the tight security right now, you may have to check it in. So my advice is to leave yours at home. OK, I think I will. Is there anything else you'd advise against bringing? Well, you won't need household or cooking things. They'll all be provided. And importing food, of course, isn't allowed by customs, though I imagine you already knew that. Well, yes. But there are one or two things I'd suggest you find room for in your suitcase. Yes? Perhaps a few of your favourite cassettes or compact discs. Of course, you might be able to find them in the shops here, but then again, you might not. That's a good idea. Anything else? Yes. Some photographs of people and places that are special to you could be nice. They can really make your room feel like home. <laughs> it's just a thought. I'll see if I've got a few good ones. <laughs> Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 7 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 7 to 10. Just a few points about packing. Make sure all your cases are clearly labelled, in English, with your host family's name and address, just in case they go missing on the way. It has been known to happen. What name do I write, by the way? It's Wark. Lewis and Amy Wark. 
So that's W-A-L-K? <laughs> it's actually W-A-R-K. But we'll be posting full details to you later this week. Right, fine. And I'd better put some essentials in my hand luggage. Enough for a night or two in case, as you say, anything happens to my main cases. <laughs> yes. I'd recommend a change of T-shirt and socks and so on, plus any medication you may need, and a toothbrush, of course. And my tights. <laughs> Your tights? Yes, for the flight. Wearing them helps prevent deep vein thrombosis when you're <sighs> flying long distances, not getting any exercise. Oh, yes, I've heard about that. Now, talking about exercise, there's one last thing. When you've packed your baggage, check you can carry it, all of it, at least 500 metres without any help. You may have to do that. OK. Well, thanks for all your help. You've cleared up a lot of points. Oh, you're welcome. Have a safe journey, and we'll look forward to seeing you next month. Bye. Bye. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You are going to hear an orientation talk. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now listen to the tape and answer questions 11 to 15. Welcome to Orientation Week. Today I am here with the captain of our school's women's gymnastics team. Her name is Elizabeth Rain, and she is a fourth-year student. I hope you can all see her as an example of a responsible student and athlete, a role model for everyone. Hi, Elizabeth. Thank you for stopping by our Orientation Week. Thank you for having me. Welcome to our university, everyone. If there are any of you thinking about joining our school's athletic program, I would strongly encourage you to do it. Being a part of the gymnastics team has been one of my best experiences during my time at this school. It has taught me so much about teamwork and friendship, and has even taught me how to improve my academics by prioritizing my time. I have some questions that I am sure the students will want to know the answers to as well. First of all, how did you find the time to do well in classes as well as train for gymnastics? Prioritizing is the key. You must be very organized. Every day I wake up and I know what I must do for the day. I plan things in order of importance. For example, if today I have a competition for gymnastics in the afternoon, then I know I have to finish my homework and studying in the morning. In other words, keeping an organized schedule of your priorities is very important. Can you explain to the students a little bit about your study habits? Well, I usually try to take classes that I'm interested in. This way, I have no excuse not to study because I chose the classes out of my own preference. I separate my study time by class. For example, if I have five classes for this semester, I will study for one class a day from Monday through Friday and then review for all of them on the weekend. I won't try and study for all five of my classes at one time. It is too hard to do that, to remember everything and not feel like you are going crazy. It is very important to focus the time that you set aside for studying. I do not study with the television on. I try to keep away from all distractions because I find that I learn better that way. But of course, how each individual will study depends on each person. Now look at questions 16 to 20.
Now listen to the tape and answer questions 16 to 20. That sounds like good advice. Let's talk a little bit about your gymnastics career. How long have you been doing this sport for, and what has been the best moment of your college participation? Well, I've been participating in gymnastics since I was a kid. My parents got me involved in the sport. Hmm, the best moment. I would have to say that there is not one single instance that stands out in my mind as the best moment, but more of a whole experience. My first year in university was definitely one of the best years of my life. I met my best friends that year and really learned to grow up and be independent. Our team went to the national championships that year, and it was an incredible experience, so I would count the whole year as my best experience in college. How about the worst moment? It is true, everyone goes through bad experiences. My worst experience would have to be the fall of last year, when I broke my wrist. I was unable to participate in sports for the remainder of the year and had to learn how to write with my left hand. I guess when I look back at it, though, even though I wouldn't wish this to happen to anyone, this experience definitely made me stronger as a person. It taught me to look at life with a new perspective and to really value the friends and family that are important and close to me. Thanks for your time, Elizabeth. Do you have anything else you want to tell the new students? Just have a good time. Don't stress out too much, but be responsible for your actions. Work hard and play hard. That's my motto for life. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. Richard Murray, a zoologist and popular TV personality, has been giving a talk on endangered species of wildlife to members of the Young Conservationists Association in a small town in the south of England. Listen to the extract from the discussion he had with two of the young people after his talk. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. What would you say, Mr Murray, are the main reasons that so much of our wildlife will have died out by the end of the next few decades? Well, Tony, we can't, of course, rule out the effect of urbanisation due to the spread of population. But apart from that, I believe there are two reasons which in a way, are like the opposite ends of a piece of string. If you tie a knot in that piece of string, you end up with a circle, and whichever way you go round, it's going to turn out to be the same. I don't think I quite get that, Mr Murray. Well, let's put it another way. It's rather like a film. You've got the good guys and the bad guys. They're pulling in opposite directions, but when it comes to the final showdown... It's hard to make out which is which. What are your two reasons, Mr Murray? I call them greed and caring. Greed and caring? Yes, I know they don't seem to have much to do with one another, but think about it. The motive of greed is pretty obvious. In the course of the next few months, thousands of baby seals will be bludgeoned to death before they're even weaned from their mothers. What for? For the sale of their skins at inflated prices to please the vanity of a few and line the pockets of the killers. Crocodiles will be slaughtered to provide shoes and handbags for the rich. 
Gorillas, tigers, leopards and rhinos will be hunted for senseless sport or poached in defiance of regulations. Their skins, their horns and their magnificent heads will be used as trophies to decorate someone's living room floor or walls. That's terrible. Yes, but it's not all. The whale, probably the most impressive and certainly one of the most intelligent sea mammals in creation, will be cruelly hunted and harpooned to make more money for the profiteers. The dolphin, the sailor's friend, will be indiscriminately battered to death at so much ahead on the grounds that it is taking away the livelihood of a few fishermen by consuming the fish in its natural habitat. But surely, Mr Murray, we do have to keep warm. We need whale oil and ambergris. Fishermen have to make a living. Part of what you say is true, of course, Tony, but we shall have to enforce far stricter controls if future generations are not to find themselves in a world devoid of wildlife as we know it. Well, I see what you mean about fur coats and crocodile handbags, Mr Murray, but I don't understand what you mean by caring. That can't be bad, surely. I mean, I thought we were supposed to be living in a caring society. Well, so we do, in a way. The trouble is, there are so many well-intentioned people who start out with the best possible motives of trying to protect or immunise us from this, that or the other in the most effective way at the quickest possible rate. But in their enthusiasm, they lose sight of the long-term consequences. It's only very gradually that the danger to other forms of life, including humans, comes out. Not to say leaks out, and by that time it'll probably be too late to do much about it. Take insecticides, for instance. But insect... Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. But insecticides protect crops from pets. They destroy disease-carrying mites and creepy crawlies like cockroaches. True, but nature has a way of developing her own immunity against insecticides and other pest controls, with the result that the biologists are driven to inventing stronger and stronger compounds, which though they may annihilate the pest, nevertheless permeate the environment, are assimilated by plant and animal life, and become absorbed by the soil. Countless innocent creatures, the beaver or the mole, for example, are performing a useful task in the natural control. The alarming prospect is that as these poisons enter the foods we eat, and consequently our own systems, They'll find their way into the body of the pregnant mother and into her milk, offering incalculable risks to the unborn or newly born infant. In spite of all our technological expertise, our time is running out. We're virtually destroying ourselves. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a tutor giving some business students instructions about a finance project. You now have 30 seconds to read questions 31 to 36.
OK, can you quieten down, please? Now, today I'm going to talk to you about your assignment. We've been studying the effects of the exchange rate, so I'm going to give you a project to do on this. Right, can you make some notes while I'm talking? The first thing that I'd like you to do in order to prepare this is to select where you're interested in. I mean, which country, and therefore which currency you're going to be operating in. OK, now the purpose of the project is to make money, and I'm hoping some of you will make a significant amount. So, I want you to suppose that you have £100 that you will have to invest purely in the rises and falls of the exchange system. In other words, you'll be trying to predict rates. This is a project that you'll be doing together, but before you work together, you'll have to go off and research what you need to know about the economy of that country and how well it's doing or is expected to do in the near future. You could all make up a little information sheet with your notes on, clearly legible, because then I want you to get together, we can do that next week, and to go round and read about each other's countries. When you see how well or badly each country is doing, I want you to decide what your exchange rate is going to be against all the other currencies. After that is all sorted, what you're going to do is go around the other students and attempt to sell your money to the others. Remember, this will depend on the success of your country's economy and the rate you fixed for your currency. Now, you're not allowed to just swap currencies with each other, but you may wish to buy from the other countries. But you must do a proper transaction. All the way through this, you must keep your accounts properly for each transaction. I'll give you one week to do this, and then we will set a time for the deals to finish, a bit like the stock exchange. And, at that point, I will ask you to calculate how much you have made. Is that clear? You now have 30 seconds to read questions 37 to 40. OK, now before you begin that, there are a few things I want you to read up on to prepare. You need to look at the economies of the UK's main trading partners. I don't mean all of them, because that would be over 80, but just the 29 principal ones. There are summaries in the last three books on the book list I've given you. And so that you can practice applying the criteria on assessment I gave you, I'd then like you to focus just on one sector across all the countries. The most common one across every country is farming. But as much agricultural produce is for domestic consumption, I'd like you to look at manufacturing. Then I would like you to do a detailed investigation of one particular aspect. I was going to give you a choice, but I think as we've just started the course, it's better if we all look at the same thing and then we can discuss it in the seminars. So the thing I'd like you all to look at is fluctuations in import prices. Now, you need to do all that before you start the project as it will help you assess the economies of the countries you'll be representing in the project. Don't worry, you've got plenty of time. Exam week is December the 8th. 
Then it's the holidays until January the 6th. So I don't need the project in till February the 5th. Is that okay? Now, any questions on this? Because it's